All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the public meeting of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Um, the time is now 1.04 p.m. on my watch and I am calling this meeting to order. Uh, as we begin, uh, I want to remind everyone, as we always do, that public comments can be submitted to the Cannabis Regulatory Commission during and after this meeting in writing via our website, www.nj.gov slash cannabis slash meetings. The deadline to submit written comments for this meeting is tomorrow, Friday, July 1st at five o'clock PM. Director McWhite, please read the notice of the public meeting. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman. This is a special meeting of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in accordance with the Senator Byron M. Bayer Open Public Meetings Act. Notice of the meeting was provided to the Asbury Park Press, Atlantic City Press, Bergen Record, Carrier Post, Star Ledger, and the Trenton Times on April 4th, 2022. The agenda and information regarding the virtual nature of the meeting due to the COVID-19 pandemic was also provided for publication and posted on the CRC website. The meeting time and location has also been posted on the website of the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission and with the Office of the Secretary of the State. Thank you. Can you please take roll call? Commissioner Barker. Present. Commissioner Del Cid Coso. Present. Vice Chair Delgado. Present. Commissioner Nash. Present. Chairwoman Wayne. Present. All members of the commission are present and we now have a quorum. The first order of business is for the commission to go into executive session to discuss legal matters and litigation updates. These are discussions that are not shared with the public and we believe the executive session to take about 30 minutes. Thank you, Director White. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? Madam Chair, I move to go into executive session. I second that. Moved by Commissioner Barker, Barker and seconded by Commissioner Del Cid Coso. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of going into executive session say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Are there any abstentions? All right, the motion passes. Um, the commission will now go into executive session. As Director McWhite mentioned, we expect the executive session to last approximately 30 minutes. We will leave this live stream running during that time and we'll return once the executive session is done. Um, so we can expect to complete, we can expect to resume the open public session at about 1.37 p.m. Thank you everyone for your patience. All right. We are back. Thank you all for your patience. The executive session has ended. It is now 1.39 and we will resume the open public portion of this meeting. Director McWhite, can you please announce the next agenda item? Sure, Madam Chair. Uh, but first, uh, at this time, I would like to correct the record. Uh, original notice for the public meetings went out late 2021. Uh, the new date and time for today's meeting was provided on June 23rd, 2022. Thank you. So the next item on today's agenda is approving the minutes of both the commission's open session and executive session held on May 24th, 2022. The minutes have been shared and reviewed by the members of the commission prior to this meeting. Thank you. If there are no requests for corrections to the meeting minutes, I will ask for a motion. So move, Madam Chair. Seconded. Moved by Commissioner Del Cid Coso to adopt the meeting minutes uh, for May 24th and seconded by Commissioner Nash. Is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the May 24th meeting minutes say aye. 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 All those opposed, 
to approving the minutes to say nay. Are there any abstentions? All right, hearing none, the ayes have it and the motion is carried. Director McWhite, can you please announce the next item? The next item on today's agenda is the chair's report. Thank you. Um, I just have one piece of news to share with everyone today. Um, this being the, the but in, in, in advance of that, before I share that piece of news, I want to wish everyone a happy pride um, and happy end of the fiscal year 2022. Uh, so the CRC plans to move our public board meetings from in virtual only to in person starting this fall. Uh, starting with our September 22nd board meeting, the remainder of this year's regular meetings will be held in person. I'll be working with the executive director to finalize the board meeting logistics and so details of those uh, details for those in-person meetings will be shared once they are confirmed. They will be updated to our website and um, notice publicized as appropriate. Um, and that is all I have for today's chair's remarks. Thank you for uh, that notice, Ma Madam Chair. Of course, Vice Chair. Uh, next item on the agenda, we have our executive director's report. Thank you. Director Brown, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, members of the commission, uh, everybody who's joined uh, to watch the meeting. Um, next slide, please. So on the agenda for today's uh, report are four things. Number one, an update on uh, license and permit applications. Um, number two, going to present some high-level information on the CRC's proposed budget. This is in accordance with the uh, governor's proposed budget and the budget being considered by the, the legislature. Um, given that this is, we're near the end of the second quarter uh, of 2022, um, as I've previously shared, we'll be uh, presenting some data on uh, uh, recreational licensees today. Uh, and then finally, going to be going over some anticipated uh, future releases here, some high-priority future releases um, so next slide, please. First, we're going to cover update on permit and license applications. Next slide. Um, so uh, starting with uh, medicinal cannabis permits um, and going to talk about the 2019 RFA. So I'm happy to report that uh, the commission has issued the first 2019 permit from that RFA. Uh, these were issued uh, towards the end of last year. So uh, congratulations to Hillview Med. Um, they're a cultivator in the Northern region. Uh, they were issued the first permit from the 2019 RFA. Uh, and they actually you know, now hold the record for fastest implementation from both the, the 2018 and 2019 RFAs uh, as far as the timeline from award uh, to permit issuance. So congrats to Hillview Med. Um, and uh, that's the first of, uh, of many here to, to come in the future. Um, otherwise, on the 2019s, investigations and applicant verification are progressing. Uh, I know entities uh, who are, were awarded are focused on building out their uh, facilities and working with our team to make sure we have everything that we need. Um, we have received some inquiries, and I, I wanted to note you know, that the deadlines in those FADs and uh, those deadlines for getting operational were included in the original RFA um, that was issued back uh, in 2019. Uh, those deadlines are the deadlines, uh, and so uh, applicants need to adhere here to those. Um, next slide, please. Turning now to recreational business applications. Um, I, we've shown this before. This shows the application submission over time. You can see that, uh, you know, there was initial rush on December 15th, another big rush on uh, uh, March 15th when we opened up for retailers. Uh, and then there's been a pretty steady uh, submission uh, thereafter. Next slide, please. Um, we have roughly 1,200 applications received so far. Um, there are only 350 that have not received an initial review. So staff are moving through these uh, qu as quickly as possible. Um, we are still seeing that we're uh, issuing more cure letters than approvals. So i.e. there are uh, applications that are coming in that need uh, to cure deficiencies before they can move forward in the process. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I did want to share, because I know there, there are a lot of, you know, 350 is still a big number. There are a lot of applicants who are, who are waiting uh, to hear one way or another um, that, uh, you know, we do expect to, to wrap up reviews of 
uh, all the remaining applications over the coming months here. Um, we've put a, uh, a strong team uh, on this, uh, you know, people who are working on applications normally, as well as a, a team of folks who, who are jumping in to assist uh, to get these processed, get them reviewed, uh, and get those that are eligible approved as, as quickly as possible. So we're going all hands on deck uh, over the summer here. Uh, as I've said to the staff, it's the summer of licensing. Um, next slide, please. Um, I do want to talk about a few things because these are factors that are impacting our overall review time and able to get through that full list. So we are still seeing a lot of incomplete applications. So, so it, applicants are submitting without all the required information. Um, we've highlighted this before, but we have a lot of information on our website. Uh, the notice of application acceptance uh, is um, uh, is is you know kind of the the. Uh, the tome here, the, the guiding document, um, that's what you want to start with and then look at all the other resources on our website to, to find out what you need to submit. Um, secondly, uh, we're seeing a number of applications attesting to a priority designation, i.e. saying they're a social equity business or a diversely owned business without submitting uh, either the proof that they qualify as a social equity business or in the case of a diversely owned business, uh, applying without having the uh, certificate, the certification from the Division of Revenue and Enterprise Services in hand. Um, so when you uh, apply, you need to have the requisite information to prove your priority. Um, that includes if you're a social Social equity business, the uh, attestation that's on our website, as well as the underlying proof that you qualify as noted in that uh, attestation. And then for a diversely owned business, the actual certification as uh, minority owned, women owned or disabled veteran owned uh, per the Division of, uh, of Revenue and Enterprise Services. Um, they are able to process uh, applications fairly quickly. Uh, and in fact, you can get a certification even when you're not generating revenue. Um, I know we've certainly received some feedback that there, folks believe that you can't but you can uh, so contact doors um, and uh, and make sure you have that certification in hand when you submit if you're submitting for a diversely owned business uh, application. Um, another thing that we're seeing is, uh, and this isn't a huge number, but certainly there are a number of applicants who receive a cure lever letter and then and then resubmit without actually curing the deficiencies. And so that, you know, they come back in, we re-review, um, that's time spent. So, you know, I, I just encourage all applicants, uh, the, the that the, one of the main reasons we went to rolling uh, application review uh, with this priority designation uh, is so that uh, people didn't have to rush to meet a specific deadline that you can come and apply to us when you're ready to apply. Um, so don't rush it. Make sure you have all your ducks in a row. Make sure you have everything that you need to to submit that application, because if you do, then you will ultimately be recommended for approval. So um, just a, a little plea there. And again, uh, you know, really spend some time going through our website and uh, Director McWhite is on his office is, is uh, certainly available to help and has been doing outreach uh, with potential applicants and uh, doing, uh, you know, educational events and such. So um, next slide, please. Uh, next, I'm going to cover uh, projected fiscal year 2023 CRC budget. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, this is in, in accordance with uh, what's, uh, you know, what's proposed by the governor, what's being considered by the, by the legislature. Um, so for fiscal year 2023, uh, the Cannabis Regulatory uh, Commission has an expected appropriated budget of $17 million. Um, that's up from close to about $10 million. I think we'll end this fiscal year around $10 million. Um, a breakdown of the budget is uh, it's approximately $11.5 million for staffing, uh, approximately $2 million for administrative program costs such as uh, technology, customer service, legal service, office supplies, host of everything we need to make the operationals, operations of the commission go. Um, approximately two, minute, two million for work group planning and development, um, which I'll cover uh, on, the, on the next slide in more detail. Uh, approximately a million for software systems. Uh, this includes seed to sale tracking, reporting systems, case management systems, and then half a million dollars for communication and outreach campaigns. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some notes here, the CRC has more than tripled our, our original staff of six uh, to over 50 during the 2022 fiscal year to accommodate the expanding program. So we've increased staff 264% uh, percent over this fiscal year, and that uh, expansion is uh, only slated to continue uh, heading into FY23. Um, the 
budget uh, as proposed would allow for continued pers uh, personnel expansion. Um, uh, this will help us uh, ensure timely licensing review, uh, compliance uh, evaluations, investigations, and uh, make sure we have everything we need uh, from an operational perspective to be successful in our work. Um, the, that $2 million um, I mentioned for work group planning, um, that is going to be used. Uh, it's dedicated in the form of uh, to support uh, work that uh, a lot of which is being co coordinated through Director McWhite's office, uh, but work groups to address access to capital, um, business development, and workforce development programs. We did a, a lot of really good preliminary work uh, over this uh, this fiscal year. That's only going to expand uh, through next fiscal year, uh, as is the uh, the office of uh, the reach of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at the CRC. Um, not included in this budget, but noted here um, is the, the fact that um, uh, it, now that we're generating tax revenue, there's money that's going into what's called the Underage Deterrence and Prevention Fund. Uh, that's a fund uh, that is able to be uh, used for initiatives to deter underage use, uh, fund prevention efforts. Um, and so that's something that we're going to be delving into very quickly. That is outside of the CRC's budget, but that, that is money uh, that the CRC will be certainly be uh, providing input on uh, and, and you know, assisting with, with uh, what it's used for. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I, I will note that the, the detailed budget has been provided to, uh, detailed projected budget has been provided to the audit committee uh, for review. Uh, and once it is uh, finalized, then uh, we'll pro provide that to the, to the full commission. Um, okay, next is uh, uh, data reporting on uh, license holders and, and awardees. So again, uh, we're at the end of a quarter here. We're uh, doing quarterly reporting on, on New Jersey's market and, and uh, who's been issued licenses, uh, how things are going. So um, to start off looking at uh, the licenses issued, and uh, these, are, uh, these are all conditional licenses so far. Um, I can tell you that we do have conditional conversion applications under review currently. Um, but uh, thus far, the lion's share, uh, two thirds have been cultivators of those approved, 92, 30% manufacturers. Uh, and and 11 or 8% uh, retailers. Now we did only start accepting uh, retailers in March. Um, so that's why that number is much lower. We expect that to go up as, as, uh, as we move forward here. Next slide, please. Um, thinking about how many of these applicants qualify as social equity businesses. Those are applicants who either have past cannabis convictions or um, are owned by individuals who have lived in uh, economically disadvantaged areas around the state, uh, zip codes with lower than average median household income, higher than average uh, rates of uninsurance, health uninsurance. Um, They're about 64% of these uh, license, conditional licensees uh, do qualify as social equity businesses. Next slide, please. Um, those who uh, attest to being diversely owned, um, those uh, there, it's uh, a little less than half. So uh, 69 out of the 148 um, uh, do uh, attest to being diversely owned. Next slide, please. Um, looking within that a little bit, 22% um, minority owned, 12% uh, woman owned, and 12% woman and minority owned. Next slide. When we break it down by majority owner, uh, the race and ethnicity of majority owner, the majority owners, uh, this is the breakdown. Uh, you can see um, uh, one uh, majority owner, American Indian or Alaska Native, 10 Asian, uh, 52 Black or African American, uh, and 21 uh, Hispanic or Latino. Um, and then uh, some that uh, have uh, noted other um, or a combination of uh, different uh, owners making up the majority um, and then 36 uh, white. Next slide, please. Um, and I will note these slides will be available after the meeting on our website to review. Um, so don't worry if you're uh, moving quickly through here because we got a, a pretty packed agenda, but um, these slides will be available for review uh, on our website as well as the recording of this, uh, of this meeting. Um, as far as those who attest having past marijuana convictions and have, have shown that as part of the social equity business designation, approximately 38% of our conditional licensees do uh, attest that they have past marijuana convictions. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, broken down by the different uh, categories of license, this is how that, that, that shakes out. Next slide. Um, so, Important to note, uh, the CREAM Act contains uh, a number of benchmarks that the commission has to meet. 
Um, and these uh, are related to micro businesses, they're related to conditional licenses, uh, they're also related to um, minority owned businesses, as well as uh, woman owned and disabled veteran owned businesses. So we're going to run through how with these conditional licenses we're doing against those benchmarks. So when it comes to micro businesses, they represent 39% of the current uh, license holders. Um, that's 14% uh, over the, the benchmark that's in the statute of 25%. Um, there's a benchmark of also 15% for each license category, uh, and we are beating it, that as well in each license category. Next slide, please. Uh, when it comes to minority owned uh, or women or disabled veteran owned, um, there we are we are beating those benchmarks as well, 34% uh, uh, to a 15% benchmark for minority owned and 24% uh, to a 15% benchmark for women or disabled veteran owned. Next slide, please. When we're talking about conditional licensees, given that they're prioritized in the licensure process, you know, this is as we would expect to see, uh, they do represent 97% of the license issued right now. Uh, the only issue, license issued by the CRC right now that are not conditional are the testing laboratory uh, licenses. Um, we do expect that to start changing uh, in the near future here. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, looking ahead, uh, there's certainly some high priority uh, items that are still on our agenda, uh, and I wanted to highlight uh, some of those so you can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, one of them, uh, and we've certainly heard from uh, stakeholders that there's a lot of concern about uh, sort of guidelines or, or regulations around how to deal with, uh, with workplace impairment. Um, so, you know, we're in the process of finalizing uh, some guidance that would be effective immediately upon issuance that will, uh, outline to employers exactly the steps that they can take today uh, to uh, protect their right under the law to have a drug-free workplace and to ensure that their employees are not uh, using cannabis uh, while at work. Um, so that is uh, coming very imminently here. Uh, secondly, um, we do expect uh, in you know sometime either by the end of July or early August uh, to release April to June, essentially the second quarter of 2022, but the first quarter of recreational sales, uh, sales totals uh, from the market. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll have our next licensee data reporting uh, in September. So we'll release similar data to that we released today uh, in September uh, again. Um, and again, the slides that I presented today will be available following this meeting. So interested parties can download them, look at them, uh, and uh, certainly, you know, submit any questions to us as, as appropriate. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the commission. Uh, with that, that concludes my report for today. Thank you, Director Brown. Um, great to see that um, we, the budget does propose um, some funds, some funding for some of our work group initiatives, because um, we know that um, this commission has been um, putting a priority and um, put, it, put in a lot of work um, for towards you know creating efforts, creating initiatives that can help boost equity and representation within the cannabis industry. So I want to thank all of our commissioners and all of our staff um, who have been a part of that. Um, and it's great to see that some funding, um, we, we hope to see some funding uh, be put towards those efforts and making those things a reality. Um, Director McWhite, can you please announce the next agenda item? Yes, the next item on today's agenda is consideration of proposed readoption of rules and proposed new rules concerning adult personal use cannabis. Thank you. Uh, we have both uh, Executive Director Brown and Chief Counsel Chris Riggs um, to, um, who will be presenting details about these proposed rules. So um, Executive Director Brown, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and as uh, our chair mentioned, I'm joined by Chief Counsel Chris Riggs. Uh, we're gonna tag team this. Um, uh, so um, next slide, please. Um, so our, uh, our initial, uh, rules were, uh, which uh, were effective for one year, were adopted uh, in August of uh, 2019, uh, pursuant to the statute. Um, our, our, this, our authorizing statutes are Jake Honig Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act and the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Enforcement Assistance and Marketplace uh, Modernization Act. And then uh, under those acts, uh, we have the regulations established by the commission. Um, so the regulations adopted last year um, uh, were effective for one year, so they expire this August. Um, and uh, the regulations uh, under consideration today, uh, if, if uh, approved, would be proposed for uh, 
for would be proposed for adoption um, in uh, uh, at a, in the New Jersey Register at a future date, and uh, Chief Counsel Riggs will cover that process in more detail. Uh, it does differ than the process we had uh, when when the Commission adopted the rules in August of 2021, and Chief Counsel Riggs will will talk about some of those differences. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as far as um, as I mentioned, the, the initial rules were uh, adopted last year. They're only in effect for uh, a period not to uh, exceed one year. Um, there is a little bit of flexibility there, which Chief Counsel Riggs will, will cover. Um, but uh, essentially after that, these rules and regulations, the ones initially adopted will be adopted, amended or readopted. Uh, and then the, the rules uh, today uh, will follow the standard uh, Administrative Procedure Act process. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover some, some very high level aspects of these rules and uh, uh, Chief Counsel Riggs will, will cover some others um, and uh, he'll, he'll talk a little bit about the APA process and, and uh, essentially what we can share today and why we're sharing it and, and when the public can expect uh, more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So some important, um, some key points uh, from what's under consideration from the commission today. So um, the rules up for proposal. Uh, importantly, they, they codify our licensing process, including the priority review uh, and approval for applications from target groups like those with past marijuana convictions. Um, we have heard from stakeholders from day one that it is vital to ensure that people with past marijuana convictions have a leg up in this market. The data that I presented showed that our process is giving them that. Uh, granted, it's preliminary. We need to make sure people can convert and, uh, and uh, get full annual licenses, but uh, initially promising. So um, it ensures that our licensing process can continue to work the way that is, is working. Um, we continue low application fees and competitive uh, licensing fees. Uh, we have some of the lowest application fees in the country. That will continue. Uh, adds, it adds details for new license types, which Chief Counsel Riggs will cover, uh, wholesalers, distributors, and delivery services. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we propose to do is expand flexibility for micro businesses. One example is by clarifying that things like bathrooms and break rooms don't factor into the 2,500 square feet consideration. Um, codifying regulation uh, purchase limits that we've uh, issued via guidance for recreational consumers, um, which is uh, one ounce of flour equals four grams of concentrates equals 1000 milligrams uh, of THC in edible form. Um, that's what a recreational con consumer can purchase, uh, in, in purchase in one transaction. Um, and they improve safety by uh, making THC and CBD levels clearer on labels and requiring retailers uh, to provide info on safe use to consumers at the point of sale. Next slide, please. Uh, importantly, the, uh, the proposed rules would also fully establish the social equity excise fee as uh, as uh, passed by uh, the legislature, uh, signed by the governor, as, as is in law, um, and uh, as the retail price of cannabis drops over time, um, then the excise fee uh, charged on cultivation per ounce will increase in accordance with this, this fee schedule. Um, so uh, right now, uh, and uh, Vice Chair Delgado is going to cover this uh, a bit later when, uh, with the social equity excise fee report, but right now it's set at a low level, which is good, and it will increase over time as, uh, as prices decrease. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Chief Counsel Riggs, and I do want to acknowledge for the Commission and for those uh, listening, just the exceptional work by the Chief Counsel, uh, as well as his team. Uh, I want to uh, especially note uh, Deputy Counsel uh, Dave uh, Toyson, uh, as well as uh, Regulatory Officer Noah Mamber, uh, who put in a lot of work on this uh, and, uh, you know, they have put together a really solid proposal. So Chief Counsel Riggs. Thank you, Executive Director Brown. And Madam Chair, may I proceed? Absolutely, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I echo those thanks to, to my team here in the Office of Chief Counsel. Very good work by Deputy Counsel Twayson, Regulatory Officer Noah Member, and uh, our now Director of Investigation and Compliance, Paul Urbish. Um, before I get into the general overview of the three license types, I want to first make a note that because of the administrative rulemaking process, the CRC cannot make this proposed draft of rules public on the website. These regulations will not be on the website immediately, but we will make them available to the public as soon as possible when they're posted in the register, or if, if there's a time before that, as soon as possible. So to go over these three new uh, license classes, just, just to note that this is gonna be a high level overview. It's not an exhaustive list of everything that these new license types can or cannot do. Um, it's just basically a, a quick summary to give the public an idea of where we're going. 
um, first the class three wholesaler license. A wholesaler can purchase usable cannabis, cannabis products from another cannabis wholesaler, cultivator, or manufacturer for the purpose of resale to another wholesaler, manufacturer, or retailer. They can store and warehouse cannabis, and they can transport usable cannabis and cannabis products to a wholesaler, manufacturer, or retailer. A class three wholesaler cannot cultivate or package cannabis on their own. They cannot produce, manufacture cannabis products, and they cannot transport, transfer, sell cannabis or cannabis products or paraphernalia directly to a consumer. For class four distributors, what they can do is transport unusable and usable cannabis between cultivators and manufacturers. They can transport usable cannabis and cannabis products between other cannabis establishments, and they can possess and engage in temporary storage of unusable and usable cannabis and cannabis products as necessary to car carry out their transportation activities. What a class four distributor cannot do is cultivate, manufacture, or package cannabis or cannabis products. They cannot sell cannabis products, paraphernalia, directly to consumers, and they cannot purchase or resell cannabis products. And a class six delivery service can, based on a purchase order from a consumer, can obtain cannabis items, cannabis paraphernalia, and related supplies from a cannabis retailer to deliver it to a consumer. They can transport that usable cannabis and cannabis products directly to a consumer, and they can return unsold usable cannabis and products and paraphernalia back to its originally uh, originating cannabis retailer. What the uh, delivery service cannot do is cultivate, package, manufacture cannabis products. They can't transport, transfer, or sell cannabis products or paraphernalia to other cannabis businesses other than a return to the cannabis retailer where the purchase order was filled, and they cannot store any cannabis or cannabis products at their administrative office. And just to note that these are just some, some highlights of what uh, these licensed classes can do. There's also some other technical edits in the existing regulations that were effective upon filing that were, uh, we made some edits and changes to make for, for clarity purposes. So I encourage you know, the public to review all the regulations and provide feedback after they're published in the New Jersey Register. Next slide, please. So this is, as far as the timeline and the process goes, as executive director mentioned, um, our, our rules became effective upon filing uh, on August 19th of 2021. They're set to expire on August 19th of this year. Um, what the CREAM Act requires is that those rules be amended or readopted prior to their expiration date, which is August 19th of 2022. Um, so today, on uh, June 30th, we're going to file them uh, with the, the uh, Office of Administrative Law. They'll be filed with the Office of Administrative Law. And under the Administrative Procedures Act, what that does is it triggers a 180-day extension on the, the rules as they exist. So those rules will still be effective for 180 days, which extends that, that timeline to February 15th of 2023. During that time period, during that process, once they're published in the register about 30 days from now on August 1st, that's when the, the public comment period opens up. And the public comment period will remain opened up for about six, for 60 days. It's set to expire on September 30th of 2022. So during that time period, that is when you know, the public will be able to comment, provide feedback on the rules, and they will be, uh, the, it, we'll provide the website, it'll be electronic form comments, but you can also provide them via regular mail to our PO box. We'll provide all that information once they're published in the register so that we can get comments to the rules. Um, so lastly, I just want to say that the regulations are just another milestone for the CRC. The, these are foundational regulations that, you know, staff did extensive research on. They talked to various stakeholders and basically we just wanted to ensure that the regulations continue to lay the foundation that we've laid for a safe and equitable cannabis market and we're going to continue to, to monitor that monitor the comments and, and move forward through that process and with that i will turn it back to you madam chair thank you chief counsel and thank you director brown um yes um, our legal team has done a tremendous work to help us get to this place where we can um, now consider our permanent uh, rules with, um, you know, in just over a year. So, so thank you to the legal team and um, all the folks who have helped the CRC get to um, get to this monumental place. Uh, so, with that, do I hear a motion to adopt? the resolution concerning the approval of proposed readoption of the specially adopted rules with amendments and new rules. Madam Chair, I move to approve the resolution for proposed readoption of the specially adopted new rules with amendments. I second that, Madam Chair. Right, moved by Commissioner Nash and seconded by Commissioner Barker. 
Is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, uh, Director McWhite, can you please call the vote? Commissioner Barker? Aye. Commissioner Del Cidcoso? Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. Chairwoman Wayna? Yes. The resolution passes. Next up on today's agenda is consideration of the commission's report on recommended uses of social equity excise fees. Thank you, Director McWhite. Uh, this item is being presented to the commission by the audit committee, which includes staff, uh, myself as the chair of the commission and uh, the vice chair of the commission, the Honorable Vice Chair Delgado. Um, and uh, he has offered to, um, to provide a summary for the full board as well as the public about this uh, recommend about this report on recommended uses for the social equity excise fee. Um, and so with that, Vice Chair Delgado, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I'd like to start with the first slide, please. Um, this our statutory requirement uh, because the CREAM Act uh, requires cannabis revenues, including uh, revenues from the social equity exercise fee to be deposited into the Cannabis Regulatory Enforcement Assistance and Marketplace Modernization Fund. 15% uh, of the monies in the fund is required to be dedicated to a sub-account within the fund known as the Underage Deterrence and Prevention Account, which uh, Director Brown mentioned earlier in his presentation. Can we go on to the next slide? On so I'd like to explain the uh, social equity excise fee uh, very bri briefly for the, um, the public. In addition, um, the uh, CREAM Act names the uh, New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission as the entity required to make uh, recommendations to the governor and legislature for social equity appropriations for any revenue collected during the current fiscal year for the social equity excise fee. Uh, the social ex equity excise fee is a per ounce flat fee assessed on all cannabis cultivated and sold in the Garden State uh, in the uh, Garden State Recreational Cannabis Market. Uh, the New Jersey uh, Cannabis Regulatory Commission adopted regulations uh, last year on August 19th that set the social equity uh, fee at the statutory required rate of one third of 1% of the average retail price of cannabis. We also, uh, on April 21st, um, uh, issue guidance uh, based on the analysis of past sales and establish the initial social equity excise fee as $1.10 per ounce. The New Jersey uh, Cannabis Regulatory Commission estimate, estimates, uh, and again, this, these are estimates, that the equity excise fee will bring in roughly $191,250 uh, before the end of the year, uh, fiscal year 2022. Now, keep in mind, that this is, these are the sales between April 21st of 2022 and June 30th, uh, which ends our fiscal year uh, 2022. And we also estimate 3.5 million in fiscal year 2023. So if we can go on to the next slide. We, uh, the commission held three regional meetings, which were required, were, which were required uh, according to the law. We hit uh, North Jersey, Central Jersey, and South Jersey uh, uh, to solicit input from community members, organizations, and other key stakeholders. With regional meetings completed, uh, this, this report, the report that we will be turning in, uh, summarizes the public input received during those meetings. The, I wanna say that the regional hearings generate a, a wide variety of ideas and considerations, and we thank the public and our stakeholders for that. However, it is noted that all hearings demonstrated some common themes throughout uh, those, uh, the input. The uh, commission has organized the common themes communicated by the participants of the regional hearings into the following four key public policy categories in recommending the distribution of revenues from the social equity excise fee. 
Those themes are one, economic development, two, justice reinvestment, three, public health, and four, workforce development and education. So let's go to our core, the next slide, which is our core recommendation. Based on the public comments received and the projected amount of expected revenue to be raised by the social equity excise fee, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission recommends investing the funds from fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023 in grants and low interest loans for aspiring entrepreneurs in impact zones and economically disadvantaged areas or areas with other economic uh, designations that overlap with uh, impact zones or uh, such as uh, urban enterprise zones. We can go on to the next slide, please. So let's look at the uh, first recommendation, uh, first category, economic development. Uh, every public uh, hearing featured participating, high, highlighting that the challenges involved in assessing capital for cannabis business, the need to assist aspiring entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds with past marijuana conventions, uh, with starting capital, and the need to target such efforts to individuals, uh, geographic regions, and communities most negatively impacted by marijuana prohibition. That is why the commission is prioritizing uh, financial assistance as a key priority in its recommendation. By investing cannabis revenue in a program to provide grants and no interest loans or low interest loans to social equity applicants or to other individuals, uh, New Jersey would ex could extend already successful equity initiatives to spur a diverse and equitable cannabis industry. Uh, we prioritize, uh, we wanna prioritize targeting revenue to support individuals and communities, uh, grants and alleviate uh, expenses such as rents, mortgages and utilities, and also utilize place-based uh, qualifiers and other criteria. Included in our economic uh, development recommendation, we are recommending funding a housing component through home ownership opportunities program for first time home buyers program for families most harmed by the war on drugs. Let's go on to our next uh, category, justice reinvestment. Um, I have to say that many participants, excuse me, in the regional uh, hearings express opinions that no revenue should fund law enforcement efforts. While law enforcement is critical is a critical element of public safety and criminal laws are written to be uh, race neutral. Advocacy groups noted that arrest data can indicate disparative uh, enforcement of those laws. So uh, points to be made, no, uh, no money for law enforcement. However, only use revenue for cannabis sales to uh, fund law enforcement purposes where statutory uh, is required. Special consideration efforts to disrupt cycles of violence, diffuse confrontations, and offer healing and support services, and also re-entry services such as housing needs, job trainings, and skill development. Let's go on to our uh, uh, next public uh, slide, which is the uh, public health uh, category. We know that uh, healthcare is one of the most uh, fundamental necessities. Participants shared insights into a range of healthcare services that can be funded through revenue from cannabis sales, including but not limited to the creation of uh, uh, um, black uh, maternal healthcare centers, the expansion of post, post, uh, pre and postnatal services to support overall improvement of wellness and healthcare needs. Uh, members of the uh, public also discussed the creation of restorative health uh, healthcare centers that offer mental health uh, conflict resolutions, harm reductions, therapy, and other services, and support expansion of HIV services were also raised. So those are, are, are the recommendations they were making. Uh, next slide, because our, um, because our, our core value is in equity and, uh, and safety, uh, uh, public health and safety messages uh, outlining through, uh, public service announcements, data collection for educational health resources, clinical research studies, and creation of technologies, uh, support creation of, of technologies 
to identify cannabis impairment uh, with some of our recommendations in the report. We can go on to the next slide, our, which is the workforce development and education slide. Uh, participants uh, in our uh, public, and during those public hearings express uh, significant interest in seeing revenue go towards a host of educational services. They share suggestions for services that offered people opportunities to learn more about cannabis and the different career path within the cannabis industry, whether they are plant touching or ancillary in nature. As a point of reference, uh, I want to uh, point out that according to a 2022 leafy job report, there are currently 428,059 cannabis related jobs in America and over 3,000 cannabis related jobs here in New Jersey. With the latter number expected to grow with the expansion of the, the personal use market here in New Jersey. With that in mind, uh, the commission recommended funding programs that promote personal and professional development through scholarships, vocational training, professional certification, apprenticeship program. Thank you, uh, uh, Labor Director Bill Wallace for that suggestion, business development, and finally, uh, financial literacy. Also, we're suggesting youth services by funding at least one community resource center in each county with wraparound services, recre uh, which include recreational tutoring, mental health services, and after school enrichment. Uh, that concludes my presentation, but I do want to thank uh, Commissioner Nash and Commissioner Barker for their insights and hard work in establishing the foundation for this important report, and also the heavy lifting of. Uh, Chairwoman Wainu, Director Brown, and his staff in getting this report over the goal line. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Delgado. Um, and yes, I'll like I'll echo those uh, that appreciation for uh, Commissioner Nash and Commissioner Barker for getting the uh, regional hearings um, done, executed. Um, and a reminder to folks: those uh, those hearings are um, available on our website, on our public meetings page. You, at the top, you'll see a tab for the regional hearings. Um, and thank you to all of the participants who submitted comments, whether it be orally during the regional hearings or in writing. Uh, so with that, do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution concerning the approval of the commission's report on the recommended uses of social equity excise fees? Madam Chair, I move to adopt this resolution concerning the approval of the commission's report on recommended uses of social equity excise fees. And Madam Chair, I second that. All right, moved by Commissioner Del Secoso and seconded by Vice Chair Delgado. Is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, may I please have the floor briefly? Commissioner Barker, yes you may. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of also piggyback on the sentiments that Commissioner Delgado said and thank Commissioner Nash and the staff here at the CRC for all of their hard work and input drafting this recommendation memo, especially the audit committee and the public engagement and education committee members. There is still a significant financial need to support our cannabis industry. And as you will read, the social equity excise fee is just a small start. It is encouraging to see the latest actions by the legislature to assist EDA in their attempt to serve the industry. And I believe that the governor and legislature understand the significant capital required to apply for and maintain a sustainable cannabis business or ancillary opportunity. And I hope, I sincerely hope that both branches consider seriously allocating additional revenue from the potential tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in the cream fund and overall budget to meet this need, especially for people and communities that have been most harmed and continue to be most harmed by the failed war on drugs. I am also confident that the public will continue to monitor how tax revenue is allocated to ensure that our cannabis industry lives up to our core values of equity and safety while reflecting the homegrown diversity in our garden state. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield my the floor. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on this motion? 
All right, hearing no further discussion, Director McWhite, can you please call the vote? Commissioner Barker? Nay. Commissioner Del Sidcoso? Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. Chairwoman Wayner? Yes. The resolution passes. Next up on today's agenda is consideration of applications for conditional licenses. Thank you, Director McWhite. Uh, Director Brown, can you please provide a summary of the conditional license applications received and the recommendations from staff? Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to everyone who worked on the, the CIF report. I'm glad to see that that passed and is, is on its way to, to the governor and legislature. Um, so appreciate all the hard work from all the commissioners and, and staff who that went into that. And as our chair mentioned to everybody who, who commented. Um, so looking at these recreational cannabis uh, applications. So the commission has before it 81 uh, additional uh, applications up for approval. Um, <clears throat> these are broken down 41% uh, standard businesses, 59% uh, micro businesses. Um, next slide, please. Um, all conditional uh, license, uh, licenses today. Um, looking at the different license types, 22 of these applications are class one cultivators. Uh, 11 are class two manufacturers and 48 are class five uh, retailers. Um, so um, these applications have gone through the uh, standard review. Uh, they've been assessed for priority, uh, reviewed for completeness, scored. Um, uh, there's been an initial uh, look at financial limitations and uh, you know qualifications for the owners and any entities involved in the funding or operation of these entities. Um, we've uh, undertaking quality control processes, uh, and these are all deemed uh, compliant with our regs, with the notice of application, and uh, uh, ready for approval uh, by this this uh, by the commission, uh, and ready to move forward in the process and ultimately work to uh, uh, get a uh, uh, an annual license. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, that we run through the list of uh, uh, of applicants up for consideration today. Um, we're gonna go through the slides. Again, these slides are gonna be available after. Um, so we'll just uh, pause for uh, about 30 seconds on each slide. Um, and there are, uh, I believe four, four or five slides uh, covering the 81. Uh, and then uh, it, we'll turn it back over to uh, our chair to, uh, to uh, move to the vote. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And one more. Oh, there might be, might be one more after this. <laughs> there we go. All right, as you can see, our staff's doing a tremendous job. Uh, 81 more uh, conditional licenses up for approval today. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Brown. Um, I'm happy to see that we are, you know, chugging through all those applications that have been submitted um, by our New Jersey um, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs um, that want to get involved in this space. Um, do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution concerning the conditional license applications for class one cannabis cultivator, class two cannabis manufacturer, and class five cannabis retailer licenses? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the uh, conditional license proposal. Second that, Madam Chair. Moved by Vice Chair Delgado, seconded by Commissioner Barker, I believe was the first to get to that second. Um, is there any discussion on this motion? Hearing no discussion, Director McWhite, can you please call the vote? Commissioner Barker? Aye. Commissioner Del Sid Coso? 
Yes. Vice Chair Delgado? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. Chairwoman Weymouth? Yes. The resolution passes. Congratulations to those 81 applicants. Um, we expect great things. Next, we have the open public comment period. All right, so as we move into the comment, comment period, um, I wanna remind everyone again, that members of the public can submit their public comments uh, both during and after this meeting uh, in writing via our website, www.nj.gov slash cannabis slash meetings. The deadline for submitting written comments is tomorrow, five o'clock on Friday, July 1st. Um, written comments are shared with the commissioner, commission members and are made public along with the meeting minutes. Uh, we will hear from those individuals who have signed up to speak in the order in which they signed up. Public speakers uh, per usual will be limited to three minutes. Please keep your remarks focused on matters that pertain to the commission's work or items that the commission should be aware of. Director McWhite will call out the names of the speakers and when it is your turn to speak, he will ask that you unmute yourself if you are dialing in by phone. We don't have anybody joining us by phone, it seems, so that's great. Uh, makes it a little bit easier. Um, but for everyone else, in order for our staff to unmute you, your full name, as it appears on Zoom, must match the name or that you used um, when you registered to speak. If you need to change your name on the Zoom platform, uh, exit the Zoom meeting and immediately relaunch the Zoom meeting, which should prompt you to enter your name. We will not be able to correctly identify you as a speaker if your name does not match what you used to sign up. So for example, I see several Allens, several Daves, um, we can never have too many Michaels. So if you have a, a, a name that you have used to sign up that does not match the name that appears on Zoom, I'm so sorry, we are not telepathic just yet, but we will not be able to identify you as a speaker. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Director McWhite to call on our first set of speakers. Good afternoon again. I'll be calling out the first five speakers. When you hear your name, please raise your hand so that you may, um, so that I may unmute you. Um, and if you can please state your name, first and last name for the record before you begin, um, we greatly appreciate that. So the first five are Gatano Lottery, Joseph Waters, Edward Grimes, Ronald Murphy, and Hira Shikesh Vilmadala. That's Gatano Liardi, Joseph Waters, Hira Shikesh Vilmadala, Edward Grimes, and Ronald Murphy. Again, Mr. Gatano, I believe, you have to sign out and sign back in with your first and last name. Seeing none of those participants, we'll move on to the next five. Michael Lawrence Zalowiski, Paula Patrice, Sharali Patel, Shergo, Shergo Alkalani, and David Fetter. I see Sharali Patel. And you may proceed. Thank you, Director. Good afternoon, members of the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Thank you for the updates. A lot of exciting news. A little bit trembling because I got a lot of good social equity folks. I got um, a conditional today. But um, my name is Sharali Patel on behalf of Blaze Responsibly. I really wanted to request um, the consideration of potentially expanding the time frame to convert for conditional licenses solely based on the fact that the real estate market in New Jersey has become predatory for really anybody seeking out cannabis property. And I understand that regulating the real estate industry from you know, price gouging is beyond the scope of the CRC's regulatory authority, 
but extending the time frame for individuals to convert to account for these present conditions would be extremely beneficial for many applicants. And so I hope that's taken into consideration as we get closer to the end of that time frame and individuals are asking for the CRC to use their discretion to extend that time. Um, there's also plenty of municipalities that continue to set their own rules despite CRC guidance. So for example, the CRC doesn't exclude applicants from being within a mini or a strip mall setting, but a, a town just told someone that they can't be in a mini mall, but that they can be in a strip, so, strip store, which I don't know the difference. Um, and the client found an affordable spot within an appropriate zone in a mini mall, but then was told of another multi-million dollar property that was being built elsewhere. It's probably gonna be unaffordable for the social equity applicant and is gonna take months to complete the build out. So either the social equity applicant locks down the lease now, pays out of pocket for an unknown period of time, or waits for the property to be done to secure, but now is beyond that conditional time frame to convert. So I think that we still need a lot of education in place, um, specifically for municipalities, because they're not sure how to proceed. And to their credit, it is still new territory for a lot of people. And so if the education doesn't stream down from the state budget, I hope that the CRC considers continuing more countywide informational sessions um, in person to educate council members, mayors, on what this industry is supposed to look like and how it's meant to work. So I know there's a lot on your plates with rulemaking, application scorings, but if we don't get municipalities to regulate at the local level with accurate and equal standards across the board, we're just setting people up to fail. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but thank you for everything that you are doing and for all the progress. Shirali Patel, can you just please state your name really quickly and spell it for the record? Yep, Shirali Patel, C-H-I-R-A-L-I-P-A-T-E-L. -E Thank you. Thank you. So again, that is uh, Shergoy, Al Kalani, David Fetter, and Scott Paul and Patri Paula Patrice. Seeing none of those, we'll move on to the next five. That's Jason Irizari. Tracy McHugh, David Mattis, and Russ Hudson. I see Scott Paul. Scott Paul, you may proceed. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Just please state your name for the record. Great. Uh, this is uh, Scott Paul. Yes, and um, so I'm the uh, I'm the owner of Newton Agriculture, an application, uh, an applicant for uh, a cold surveyor license, and uh, I just have a question. I know there was a there was a, um, a breakdown of all the uh, approved applications, and um, you know the demographic breakdown of everybody. Um, but so have all the licenses approved so far? Have they all been priority applications, uh, social equity, or diversely owned? Because I, I, we put in our application uh, over five months ago. Um, I've been told for a couple months that we're being um, that the application is being reviewed. But like every month, I'm, I'm just like confused as to why um, you know ours hasn't been. Uh, there's no decision on ours yet. I have municipal approval already. I had a letter from the mayor um, endorsing our application. It's just, uh, you know, as a as a minority business, I know a major consideration is that black applicants generally don't have the immediate access to capital as others might. Um, and the, the license is like sort of a golden ticket to be able to confirm investors. So um, as you know, someone mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, there's a lot of predatory behavior going on from um, business owners and, and just in real estate and now like we're in a position where we're getting boxed out of the space that we had because we can't pay for it because we don't have a license. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't really understand what the holdup is. I don't know if everybody is waiting, you know, five months for their um, applications to go through. I know you guys are going through a lot of applications and there's a lot of stuff to consider there. Um, I'm just kind of at a loss and I don't know what to tell anybody. I don't know what else to do. Um, yeah. Again, I'm, I'm a certified minority business, um, and yeah, yeah, that was a uh, that that's my my question. Just are all of the applications that have been approved so far have they all been um, social equity? Have they all been uh, diversely owned? 
Um, and is everybody, you know, waiting this long? Or I guess, what can I do to um, have mine actually be reviewed? Because I've, I've been told the last couple of months that it's being reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Paul. Uh, just to yes. note, um, for questions respect with, regarding your particular application, um, all applicants are directed to uh, submit their inquiry to the uh, CRC licensing email uh, address um, and staff check that on a regular basis. Um, and so that is the, the best way to get information specific to your, um, specific to your application. So that is crc.licensing at crc.nj.gov. I see David Mathis. You may proceed. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my name is David Mattis, M-A-T-I-S. Um, I am the co-owner um, and president of Dirty Jersey Kids. Um, first, I would just like to thank the commission for approving our conditional licensing today. It is a dream come true, definitely. Um, I did have a question, though, for the commission. Um, there is a, um, an issue that seems to be going around the entire state um, as far as pop-up shops with gifting, um, particularly in the town of Sussex Borough, where we are um, just going to be setting up shop. Um, there has already been one store that has been fined for illegally selling cannabis. Um, there has been a store raided. Um, and arrested um, an individual for setting up shop and selling. There is another store that just currently opened up last week. Um, my question is, is what is the CRC doing, if anything, to stop these stores from um, popping up? Um, I find that it is turning a lot of potential customers in the future off to um, real legal stores. Um, and it's going to really cause an issue for our um, our businesses when we do open up. Um, and if there's something that we can do, how do we combat um, these illegal stores opening up and quote unquote gifting their products? Thank you. That's the question I had. Thank you. The next five on our list is Robert Karp, Hugh Giordano, Jennifer Condren, Alexander Klangeshev, and Christopher Marsh. Those individuals are here. Please raise your hand so that we may unmute you. I believe I see Alexander. So Alexander, it looks like you're using an older version of Zoom and it won't allow you to talk. Um, you can dial in and follow the instructions that the chair gave us gave you earlier. Um, let me just see if I can. Yes, so you wanna dial in and press six to unmute yourself and we'll get you right in. But you're using an older version of Zoom and it won't allow you to talk. So I also see Hugh Giordano. You Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Excellent. Um, thank you, uh, Vice uh, uh, Chair, uh, Vice Director. Um, I want to say first hello to Executive Director Brown, Chairperson Wayne Vice Chair Delgado, and Commissioner Nash Barker and Dilsey Cotto. Um, Hugh Giordano, H U G H, Giordano, G I O R D A N O, of the UFCW Local 360. Um, I first want to say congratulations to the 81 conditionals approved today. Um, as the official cannabis labor union under the guise of the AFL-CIO, we look forward to working with you. Um, I also want to say it was nice to hear that um, the commission has hired more workers for the commission directly. Very proud of that because I know that uh, the CWA, our brother and sisters at the CWA represent the public sector workers. So thank you to the commission for keeping your word on equity and justice and creating more good union careers at the commission itself. You should be applauded for that. 
Um, wanted to give just an update to the commission and to the public because I think it's important uh, for the commission to know who, um, which employee employer partners are actually following the LPA laws um, and also bargaining in good faith. And I actually have some really good news and some happy news. Um, we are beginning the card check process for Harmony Dispensary. Um, so Harmony going uh, soon enough, the workers have already uh, chosen um, under uh, the LPA legislation to join and form a union with the UFCW. So we're happy to announce that Harmony workers have chosen to do that. Um, and that will be solidified uh, ASAP with Harmony. So I wanna thank Shia um, and Yosef um, and Rob Maroney uh, for their leadership and doing the right thing. Um, and we're proud of those workers for standing up for social equity and justice. Um, we're beginning negotiations with GTI and the botanists as well, um, who have been good partners so far um, in good conversation. Um, again, abiding by the labor peace requirements of the state. Um, we will be beginning um, conversations with the cannabis uh, soon enough. Um, I wanted to also say that we've been having lots of conversations with our union members in these in these dispensaries in regards to uh, patient access, and we're having conversations to make sure that patient access is protected. Workers are the first line of defense. Um, very excited about the future. Want to thank uh, everybody for the hard work at the CRC. Um, I want to thank uh, specifically uh, the good employers who are coming forward. Um, we have a lot coming down the pipe. Uh, in regards to not only LPAs, but project labor agreements with our union brothers, sisters at the trades. Um, you know, thank you for to Commissioner Nash and Barker for caring about apprenticeship programs. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. I see Christopher Marsh. And you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, members of the commission. My name is Christopher Marsh, K-R-I-S-T-O-F-E-R, -E Marsh, M-A-R-S-H. And I'm here today representing um, the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association's Laboratory Testing Committee. Uh, we are a group comprised of scientific professionals who represent independent testing labs, biotech companies, standards organizations, and, and others uh, who are here and ready to help the CRC wherever laboratory testing is involved. Um, to date, we've advised the CRC on best practices pertaining to remediation. Uh, we're also currently working with the CRC to propose a robust set of ready to adopt um, regulations regarding testing for the state of New Jersey. And um, I know that we have a, a meeting in a couple of weeks um, to discuss that further. Um, today, I, I just, I wanted, we wanted to present to the committee um, that the laboratory testing committee uh, is uh, here to help the CRC with lab shopping, uh, if if so desired. Uh, the concept of lab shopping exists in many states and markets where cannabis and marijuana is is legal, both medically and recreationally. Um, this is something like if you know whoever, whichever lab produces the highest THC or CBD numbers or maybe the lowest failure rates is the one that you know, most clients go to and whether that lab is right or wrong. And this practice, you know, it's, it really does not ensure that patients are getting safe and effective products. And so uh, multiple states have developed mechanisms to identify such testing, uh, including looking at trending of statewide data, looking for atypical results, uh, the state providing blinded samples to laboratories, uh, sort of a secret shopper kind of program if you will, um, and the creation of a state testing uh, laboratories to operate as a reference lab. Uh, we think it's very important um, that the state and the CRC and um, everyone involved at the LTC work together to ensure that labs are, are generating accurate and reliable data in order to ensure patients and customers get safe and effective medicines. So with that, I wanna thank you uh, for your, my, the time today and um, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you so much. The next three on the list will be Robert Allen, Raymond Cantor, and Chris T. I see Ray, Raymond Cantor. If you could just state your first and last name for us for the record. Robert Allen. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Raymond Cantor with the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Um, I'm going to thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak here today. Um, NJBIA is the largest state uh, employer uh, organization in New Jersey. Um, and we have and have had a keen interest in the issue of workplace impairment. We were working with the legislature when the, um, the law was first enacted and we've been working with this commission and its staff uh, since that point in time to try to come up with workable workplace impairment regulations and for the certification of wires. Um, we are disappointed that the regulations uh, that were approved here today do not include the regulations to certify wires. I'm sure we, we do appreciate all the work that the commission has been doing in standing up a new industry in um, doing the impossible by adopting regulations uh, now twice within uh, a short period of time. But the issue of workplace impairment, as I am sure you all recognize is significant, uh, not only to the employer community, but also to the public at large. We do not want accidents to happen on our work sites uh, especially in areas where we have um, uh, a significant um, uh, potential for harm, we want to make sure that the community is protected and we need those regulations in place. We are encouraged by Director Brown's statement today that uh, uh, the commission will be issuing guidelines very imminently. Um, we would ask that the commission and staff uh, meet with NJBIA uh, before those guidelines are issued to make sure that we understand what they are and that we could hopefully clarify any types of problems that may be uh, you know, in that and that they are as workable as possible. We will also remind the commission that while we appreciate uh, that you are moving forward with guidelines to try to solve some of the employer you know, issues that we are having, that guidelines are not the same as regulations. Um, you know, we, um, understand uh, that, that uh, again, guidelines will be helpful and, and we've asked for them you know, in the interim, but regulations are legally binding. They are what is expected you know, um, through the Administrative Procedure Act and required by law. Um, so while guidelines may be helpful in the short period of time, we would uh, still recommend that the commission work on a longer term regulatory fix um, and again, and we would you know, like to know when we'll be seeing those guidelines and when uh, we can expect those regulations. And again, as always, we uh, offer our assistance and look forward to working with the commission and its staff. Thank you. So I see Alex, uh, Alexander, rather, Kleindeshaf. Let's see if you are good to go. Ah, there we are. You may proceed. Just please state your first and last name. Sure. How are you? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, it's Alexander Klenchfog. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable CRC. My name is Alexander Klenchfog. I am a veteran who served as a Navy FMF corpsman during Operation Unified Protector, and now I am the president of North Lake Supply LLC. We are a conditional class one cultivation applicant. We are majority woman owned, currently have land secured that's shovel ready have all of the necessary township and zoning approvals, and we also have signed labor peace agreements with the local UFCW 152, as well as bonus points, including state residency of over five years, because we are an actual local business looking to enter the New Jersey recreational market. We first submitted our conditional application on December 15th, which was the first day allowed for submissions. In 90 days later, we were notified that we needed to, and we needed to provide personal history disclosures our passive investors. Seven days later, we had all of the information submitted. It is now over six months since we have submitted our for conditional approval. So far, the people benefiting from New Jersey's recreational sales are all of the previous MSOs, while all of the small business owners, minority business owners, and female business owners are once again being left behind. We would all greatly appreciate more communication and clarity on how applications are being reviewed and how each individual's merits are being evaluated. New Jersey has a historic opportunity to create an industry that benefits its disadvantaged communities and small businesses. Our hope is that this does not, this does not get turned into the hands of large corporations 
whose goal is to enrich their out of state. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to call one more time uh, registered speakers, uh, folks that have registered with their first and last name that might have missed uh, their opportunity to speak. That is Joseph Waters, Hirishikesh, Vilma Dalla, uh, Edward Grimes, Ronald Murray, Michael Lawrence Zalawiski, Paula Patrice, Shergoy Alkalani, David Fetter, Jason Irizari, Tracy McHugh, Russ Hudson, Robert Karp, Jennifer Cond Condren, Robert Allen Christie. I see Robert Allen. You may proceed. Thank you, everyone. My name is Robert Allen. My professional affiliation is with Canna Pop Up, but I'll be speaking as a medical cannabis patient today. I'd like to wish my entire cannabis family a very happy 4th of July holiday weekend. I have two concerns today. One is regarding uh, the dispensaries' websites. Most of the dispensaries are not keeping their websites up to date with current um, availability. Uh, I know many patients are using the website not to necessarily place online orders, but to, um, to figure out what they want in advance so they don't have to spend extra time once they reach the dispensary. Um, there are many dispensaries that are just not displaying product that they have. They're not displaying current THC levels consistently. Some dispensaries are displaying them, some are not. Um, and it makes it very, very difficult. So I would like, if possible, for someone at the CRC to take an occasional look at the websites to make sure that they are indeed up to date and accurate. Um, when I've inquired at the dispensaries, I've been told that there's a third party company that, um, that handles that and it's very difficult for them to keep the website up to date. Um, unfortunately, I don't believe that to be a valid reason. Um, my second concern is regarding a product that I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, a product that was pulled by your governing body, which are the PAX pods, uh, vaporizer pods. Um, and I'm not sure if that's accurate, but according to my dispensary, um, they've been pulled uh, for whatever reason, um, which I find dismaying because it is currently the only delivery method that is actually measurable by dose. Okay. So for, you know, if indeed that it's accurate that the CRC has pulled the PAX pods from availability. I am very concerned about that and would, would love to hear um, any input that you might be able to share regarding that particular product. And I'd like to wish all of you a very happy holiday weekend as well. So okay. is there anyone that, you know, I, I don't know if you have any information about that or anything regarding that, but if you could share that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So I'm going to call on uh, Gatano Larderary, and please state your uh, first and last name for the record. Uh, Gatano Larderi, can you hear me? Yes, you may proceed. Uh, Chair Wayno, Executive Director Brown and Commissioners, uh, these public comments today are a follow-up to the public comments submitted to the CRC at its meeting on the 24th of May. Comments today in general are to advocate for the advancement of cannabis research in New Jersey as specifically relating to the clinical registrant applicant permits referenced by Senator President Scutari in the Senate Judiciary hearings held in Trenton on May 12th. In response to Senator Scutari's question in reference to the status of clin clinical registrant permits, Director Brown pointed out that this was on, was on the CRC list of high priorities. Selection of diverse clinical registrants should be a high priority. This application permit process is complex and capital intensive. These make for intensive barriers for, of entry. It has been well documented that racial bias exists in healthcare field and is one of the underlying factors preventing diversity in clinical research. Diversity in cannabis research is important as you are all well aware and strongly support. 
Diversity in research will help break these barriers to address and provide answers and solutions to the harms done by the war on drugs and other very important socioeconomic questions of inequity and inequality. Through the guidance of the CRC, New Jersey should be a leader in cannabis technology, science, education, and development. Let's work together and strive to have New Jersey's clinical registry program as robust as our neighbor to the West. Pennsylvania currently has seven major institutions up and running in their program. Also, may I add, and am well aware that at this time it is not within the CRC's purview that in conjunction with legislators and with the next draft of regulation, what should be taken into serious consideration is entheogenic medicines, that is plant medicines. And yes, you heard it here first, psychedelics. In my opinion, from the research I have reviewed out of Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Yale, and other prestigious institutions, these plant medicines will have a profound and major impact on all of mental health in general. I believe we have several potential New Jersey champions in this respect. The first being from my own city of Newark and our junior senator from New Jersey, Corey Booker. Senator Booker recently sent a letter to the acting director of the NIH and commissioner of the FDA advocating for psychedelic research. Our second is a New Jersey Senate President Nicholas Scutori, who recently filed the Psilocybin Behavioral Access Services Act. Champion number three is Governor Phil Murphy, who back in February of 2021 signed the Psilocybin Bill to immediately reduce penalties for possession. We encourage you to objectively consider the recent research and strong political advocacy for entheogenic medicines within the purview of patient advocacy. The future of the industry lies in a full spectrum of research and development that is inclusive of diversity from the farmer to the nanotechnologist. Everything you need is right here in front of you and the talent and diversity of the people of New Jersey. In this light, calls the act to action for the CRC are to form a diverse and inclusive advisory board expeditiously, include New Jersey subject matter experts in the areas of research, pharmaceuticals, academia, business, and advocacy, consider research for entheogenic medicines in the next legislative and regulatory guidelines. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. And lastly, I see uh, uh, sativacross.org, I believe that is Edward Grimes, just for future public meetings, please register with your full name and not your affiliated organization. Please state your name for the record before you proceed. Good afternoon, this is Edward Lefty Grimes. Sorry about that, I actually changed it again, but that wasn't correct, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> thank you for all your hard work. You're kind of up against it sometimes with the legislature and I get that. Uh, so one thing I'd like to say though, we, um, We'd, well, first of all, we'd like to invite you all to the State House on July 10th. It's for Cannabis Patient Awareness Day. It's going to be a national holiday. We're trying to make it a national holiday where patients get the representation they deserve here in New Jersey and across other states. We're having the State House from Oregon take part and the State House in California taking part. And we're also in New Jersey. So we'd like to invite you all to come out to the State House on 710 to celebrate cannabis patients. Because um, my 501c3, we're, we're a Sativa Cross 501c3, advocating for patients' rights and for wheelchair access. We have been rallying at Senator Scutari's office, trying to encourage him to the uh, cannabis bills up for a vote. The bills I'm talking about are the home grow bills and the uh, insurance coverage bills. And I guess after today, it's going to have to wait, but hopefully in September, he'll put those up for a vote. Now, here's, here's the deal, though. When I'm out there, I'm approaching or encouraging to vote. I have a sign. It's a huge license plate, and it says Home Grow, hashtag Jeff's Law. And when I have the sign up, a lot of people are coming up to me, and they're asking me, why are you here protesting? It's legal. We voted for it. It's legal. I'm like, no, you'll go to jail if you grow weed. And every person I talk to in Linden couldn't believe that you go to jail for, for growing weed and selling weed because... They didn't vote for that. And they feel like they've been bamboozled and hoodwinked because this is not what we voted for. We voted for, I voted for a constitutional right to grow. So what's happening is the social justice we're talking about is creating a whole new class of Jim Crow, Jim Grow, where people think you can grow weed and you actually can't. And like Guy was just talking about the mushroom bill, the mushroom bill includes home growth for mushrooms. So I do the hobby that's, you know, uh, Mr. Grimes, I'm sorry, we were, we're unable to hear you. Uh, 
Th thank you, Mr. Grimes. We, we're, we're really unable to hear you. Thank you for your comments. You can submit written comments to us as well. Um, I see Paula Patrice. You may proceed. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the CRC. My name is Paula Patrice, P-A-T-R-I-C-E. I'm representing Illtown Growers, a cultivation applicant. Uh, we submitted December 15th as a social equity business. I'm looking for clarity on how to communicate with the commission as far as application status and how to update documents. I have attended all of the webinars. I am up to date on information and recommended ways to communicate. In my case, um, when the commission came back at the beginning of March and asked for additional documentation to many applicants um, for the SEB affidavit, um, there was one tax form that I had been missing. So in my case, I waited a couple of weeks and then thought because we always have this rolling process that I would be able to reopen my portal and update my documents. That did not seem to be the case. I have not been successful in requesting that the portal be reopened. And given that we have had you know, six months now of time, of course, there are documents that we want to update or submit with our application. So I am just wondering, what is the best way to up the, update those documents? Because I've been sending tax returns and other documents by email. This does not seem like a secure channel of communication. And then additionally, I do see that my emails are read, but I don't get any replies. So just to manage expectations, can you tell me how quickly new documents are applied to an application and um, maybe just illustrate the rolling process a little bit better. By by rolling, does it mean, you know, a couple of a couple of months later, you know, my social equity standing would have gone back into place, or, you know, how how does that priority process work when an SEB updates documents that um, purportedly should put them higher up in the priority? Um, where other, you know, applicants who aren't an SEB um, or maybe just a standard applicant are getting their conditionals. Thank you, Ms. Patrice. Um, since your question is specific to your application, we'll um, have our staff follow up with you offline. Uh, last but certainly not least is Hirshikesh Vilmadala. Please state your name, uh, first and last name for the record, and you may proceed. Hi, uh, my name is Rishikesh Vimadala. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Greater Purpose as one of the co-founders uh, and the CEO. Uh, Greater Purpose has applied for a class two processing conditional license. Uh, Greater Purpose is a minority owned business with over 80% equity owned by longtime New Jersey residents. We have a signed resolution from our town that supports our application. We have a zoning permit from, uh, for the proposed location from the town. We have complete control of the proposed location. Uh, we have uh, everything else that we need to get started. Uh, what we do not have is an update on the status of our application. It's been over 134 days since our application was submitted. Uh, on February 10th, uh, 2022. Uh, we've, we've sent uh, several emails uh, asking for status or at least uh, any indication on how long we would have to wait to hear back uh, about our application, uh, but we've not received anything. Uh, we, we, we really hope there is a, way, a better way for us uh, applicants to find out how long before uh, we have to get everything else ready to get going. Uh, this would really help applicants that uh, were not able to submit right away and have no idea how long they'll have to wait. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. And so uh, again, um, since your question is about a specific application, we'll ask our staff to follow up with you offline. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, this concludes the public uh, comment portion of today's agenda.
Thank you, Director McWhite, and thank you to everyone who spoke today. Um, this concludes the business that we have before us this afternoon. Uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Madam Chair, I move to adjourn today's meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Barker. For a moment there, I thought everybody wanted to stick around for a little bit longer. Uh, so moved Seconded. by Commissioner Barker, Barker, seconded by Commissioner Nash. Thank you. Is there any uh, discussion on this motion to adjourn? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, the ayes have it and the motion passes. The time is, thank you all for uh, joining today's meeting. Um, congratulations again to the 81 conditional license awardees. Um, for members of the public, please um, visit our website to view the approved 2022 calendar of uh, meetings. And again, um, beginning in September, our meetings are planned to be uh, in person. So more details on that will follow. The time is now 3.11 and we are adjourned. Have a great evening, everyone.